you'd be with them and take care of them. God, I pray for our sick tonight, that Lord, uh, whoever they are, and uh, we got the list of them, God, I pray that you would bless them, bless their families. God, I thank you for the privilege of serving you tonight. Lord, I just pray now as we uh, begin to try to teach your word, God, that the Holy Spirit would uh, uh, lead us, and uh, God, that we would say something, Lord, that would help us to, to understand who you are, to understand your love, but also to understand judgment, too. So, Lord, bless tonight. You can take these next few minutes to study together. For us in Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we come up last Wednesday night, we stopped in the third chapter of Isaiah. We went uh, through verse 5. And so I want to uh, pick up there tonight and... Uh, Take it on, and I don't want to. I've, I've been through this one time, so I don't want to. I, I can stay on one or two of these verses for the whole night, but I don't want to do that. I just kind of want to get a, a little background of it and then move on. Now, what has happened is this, and we know it. Y'all know, y'all hear me enough. Y'all know. Children of Israel have turned their back on God. He gets on them about everything. Remember last week, he talked about the leadership, he talked about the preaching. He talked about everything that he was condemning them for, that they had turned their back on him. And so we talked about that. And he goes on a little bit in the study tonight because the problem with the children of Israel, as I talked about last Wednesday night, they had no leadership. Their leadership had turned them totally away from God. And that's what had happened. And sooner or later, if you continue to turn your back on God, personally or nationally or whatever, there's always going to be a price to pay for that. Somewhere down the road, somewhere. And so this is what he, this is kind of where they had got. Uh, he says, uh, he talked about the fact that in verse 4 that they were being led by children or people didn't know what they were doing. And he said babes were ruling over them. And in other words, the old voices weren't heard anymore. And so it, and it, and he says about the people being oppressed and, and all these things. We talked about that. But then in verse 6, let's try to move through this. He says, It'll be a time when a man shall take a hold of his brother of the house of his father, saying, Thou hast clothing, be thou our ruler, and let this ruin be under thy hand. What he's saying in that scripture is pretty much this. As he pictures the collapse of a nation, the nation of Israel, he pictures that. He gives this story. Anarchy is so bad in the children of Israel to nobody wants to lead anymore. Nobody, the reason is, their problems are so bad in the country that there's nobody that wants to take on the job of trying to get them back on the right track again. And so he goes, it, 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 what he says, what this simply says is this. When he goes to his brother, his brother is a rich man. That's what that scripture means. And he goes to the rich man and he says, how about you taking it over? How about you trying to set things in order and get us back? And what does he say? Uh-uh. Too big a mess. Me and all my money can't straighten this mess out. And that's, that's exactly, and what that just simply says to me and you, as it said to the children of Israel then, they had gotten so far from God that God wasn't on their mind and what he's saying here is, man will never have the remedy to fix what's going on with you. Same way in the world today. Man is not the answer. I don't care who you elect president. I don't care who you elect governor. Ain't nobody's name on one of those ballots that is the, pro is the answer to the problems that's in the world today. That's what he's saying here. No matter how much money they have, know what they can do, they have no answer. So he says no. 
In that day shall he swear, saying, I'll not be a healer, for in my house is neither bread nor clothing. Make me not a ruler of the people. He says, no. That's something I don't want uh, anything to do with because I can't fix it. Verse 8. For Jerusalem is ruined. Now, folks, you need to understand that's God's chosen city. That's where one day he rules the world from. When he comes back to this earth, that's where he goes to. That's where he comes back to. And he looks at it in the spiritual condition that the nation is in of his own people that he had sent personal prophets to to, to warn them, to tell them about what's coming, and they paid it no attention. So he may say, through Jeremiah, or through Isaiah, he makes a statement. You're ruined. Talking about Israel. Talking about the city of Jerusalem there. He says that you're ruined. Judah, the nation of Israel, the tribe of where Jesus would come from, what does he say about it? It's fallen. Israel may be in the top Spirit, worst spirit condition that there are in the Bible right now. When God says, tell them, Jerusalem is ruined, the tribe of Judah is in a mess because they've turned their back on me, those are strong statements from God. And then he, listen, God don't have to explain himself, not to me. I learned a long time ago not to try to figure out what God's doing. I just accept whatever he is, go be, go be. I'm like, what was that one case of Ra, Sara years ago? You know, young folks don't know that. There's a song that said, and what shall be, shall be. That's what I believe, and that's the way I live. Try to live it. But he says this, because, he said, let me tell you why you messed up. Let me tell you why your nation's in ruin. Let me tell you why your, your capital, your Jerusalem, let me tell you why it's in ruin. He says, what? Because their tongues and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of the glory. He says, your problem is this. And he nails it down. When he says in that scripture that your tongue and your doings are against the Lord, what's he saying there? The things that come out of your mouth, the things that you're saying, your words and your actions prove that you're not following me. And he talks about God watching. If there's ever a people in the history of the world that God ever watched out for, it was Israel. Why? Because they were chosen, weren't they? He was looking out for them. And I'm sure that it pained him to to say something like this to his own people, but they had drifted so far that they have provoked the eyes of his glory. The show of their countenance does witness against them. This is a tough verse of Scripture. I love it, though. The show of their countenance does witness against them, and they declared their sin as Sodom, and they hide it not. Folks, do you realize what a, a powerful verse of Scripture that is? God calls out, listen, God calls out the sin that has upset him the most. And it was the same sin that he had destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah for. He says, listen, y'all heading down the same path that they were down. I mean, this is not what most people would expect. But he says this, and this is where they were then, and this is where we are today. He said, you do your sins, and you don't try to hide it. You flaunt it. You flaunt the same sin that destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. You walk around. There was a time when I grew up where we you did we sinned and we did things wrong. I did. But folks, let me tell you what I did with it. 
I tried to hide it. Man, I didn't go broadcasting like the people do today. Marching and walking and, and, and parades and all that stuff. When I grew up, when you did something wrong, you tried to hide that sin. But not today. He says, not only do you not hide it, but you've flown it. And he says, woe unto their soul. Woe unto their soul. Who's that? The people that were openly flaunting their sin, throwing it in God's face, and telling him. This is what it says when you do that. God, I don't care what you think. I'm going to do what I want to do. That's what that verse of Scripture says. I don't care what you folks. This is 3,000 years ago, but I could pick the newspaper and news out and say that's exactly where we live today. Ain't nobody ashamed to sin no more. No. It's wide open. There's a lot gate. And he pronounces and he says unto them, Woe unto your soul. Anytime, and we've been through this with some of my studies with y'all. Anytime God pronounces a woe on somebody, you can be sure of one thing. Something really bad's about to happen here. So he pronounces a woe on them because of the way you're living, because you're not ashamed of it. You become like Sodom and Gomorrah. <coughs> That's what you have become. God looked at Sodom and Gomorrah and he said, a nation can go no lower than what you've gone. You don't deserve to exist anymore. Folks, I know I'm a hard nut, but I'm going to tell you this right now. You can play with sin, you can mess with sin, and preachers don't want to talk about sin no more, but I'll tell you right now, you read this third chapter of Isaiah, and it ought to scare you to death dealing with sin. Deal with it with God in his mercy and his grace. But he says, listen, your final outcome, if something don't change, is going to be the same fate as Sodom and Gomorrah had. So, say ye to the righteous, that it shall be well with them, for shall, they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Now, who's he talking about? The people that followed him. The people that, that believe what he said. The people that tried to live their life in righteousness like God wanted them to. And you understand something. God's always and always will have a remnant. The Bible tells us that. They're all, even though there is, and we know it, so much evil and sin and wickedness in the world, folks, don't forget. There's a lot of Christian people in the world, too. But what we've done is chose just to not confront it. Just kind of live, don't affect me and my family, I'll let it go. That's, that's what's happened to us today. He says, but those that have stayed true, you're going to be rewarded one day. They shall be well with him and eat the fruit of their doings. Of course, that old, you want to know what that old saying that says, this is my opinion, you reap what you sow, came from that verse of scripture right there. He said they will be rewarded for their doings in there. And then he goes back, as much as he talks about the righteous. And he talks about it's going to be well with them. Folks, you better be glad you're a child of God. As this, as, this, as this curtain is closing down on this world. Because it's okay. It's kind of like that, that song that we have in our hymnal that says, All is well with my soul. I hope all is well. Because you trust the Lord and you're leaning on him to take you through and take you to the end. That's what he's saying there. It's going to be well, but how about those that don't? How about those that just continue? Folks, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question. 
Do you think that the world that you and I live in can get much worse than it is now? I thought about that today and I said, what in the world can we do that's worse than what's going on in the world we live in today? He destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. He's fixing to do the same thing to his own people for that sin that followed him. And so he says, righteousness will be well with you. But then he says in verse 11, woe unto the wicked. Those that don't listen to my word, those that do not believe I'm God. You don't want to fall into that crew. I'm going to tell you that right now. Because he pronounces a woe and he says, woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with them. For the reward of his hands shall be given unto them. What's he talking about here? The judgment of the wicked. When it's all said and done, and it's all gone, and God has called his church home, understand something. His church, the righteous that he talked about in that verse of Scripture, will go to the Lord, and they will go to what the Bible calls the judgment seat of Christ. Every Christian has to go there. We're not going there to be judged whether we're saved or not. You need to understand, lost people don't go to this judgment. And folks, we need to understand, all that's judged and taken care of before you leave this world or it ain't going to get taken care of. You either get it right now. There's no second chances when it's, once it's over with here. There is no purgatory. There is no place you can go after you leave this world. And, and like I went to a funeral one time and they said, well, he didn't go to heaven right now, but if we'll keep praying and you keep giving enough money, we'll get him out there and he'll go. I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, I'm one of the dumbest people in this building. I said, but how can you believe that? Show me in the Bible where you can pray somebody out of hell. It ain't there. No. Sounds good, though, don't it? Live any kind of way you want to do, do anything you want to do, and if you die without Jesus, i tell you what we'll do. We'll keep praying for you, and we'll double our tithes, and you know what? One day after we've been so good, God's going to let you go. I, I got a book. I was reading it the day it came in. It's uh, actually a, not the Sunday school book I use, but I order these books just for my own personal study. And I got, got one today. And one of the subject in that book, it talks about the temptations of the world, and it's a book about, and it's a several-week study of Satan. And I read a chapter or two of it today. Just I, it, 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 it piqued me interest when I read it. And the guy that wrote this, he's pretty sharp. And this is what he said. The greatest damage that Satan has ever done to the world or will ever do is to get people to believe a lie. He has done more harm through a lie than any other way. And he began to give examples of that. And what does the Bible say about him? That he's a liar. And the truth ain't in him. He cannot tell the truth if you stuck a gun to his head and made him bite. Jesus said he don't even have the truth in him. But man, people like to listen to him evidently because they follow him. No, you and I know it's a lie. Woe unto them. So the judgment seat of Christ, when you die and you're a child of God, that's where you're going. That's where I'm going. But it won't determine where I'm going. It will determine what rewards that I've earned on this earth or you've earned on this earth by serving him. It determines where I go in heaven. He, he decides all that. But then at the end of the Bible, there's a last judgment. It's called the great white throne judgment. Now, 
Folks, these people right here that he pronounced woe on, that's where they go. Now, I want to be in the first part. Blessed he is has part in the first resurrection. The Bible says that that great white throne judgment that he's pronouncing on them right now, that ain't come yet, that's coming. The Bible says in that scripture something like this, that death, hell, and the grave will give up all the people that rejected Jesus. No matter where you died at, Remember I had Dwight, oh, it's been, I don't, it might be a year ago now, I, I had him show you a video, and it said, everybody's got to talk to God. Which one of those you want to talk with him at, the first one or the second one? You don't want to vote the second one. I'm just telling you, he declares final judgment on those folks that have rejected him, even his own people that has rejected them. As for my people, children are their oppressors. Women rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy path. He kind of, if you remember in the Bible, in the Old Testament, God put man in charge of most everything. That's just what God did. He goes back to what he said before. He uses it twice about the young people that are sweeping in. And I heard a statistic the other day. So I've, already, I've always heard of Generation X and Generation Z and, and probably some of the only thing I know is they're younger than I am, a lot younger. They're younger than my children are. Generation Z. They had a thing on the news the other day. Mike tickled me the other night, though. When I was wound up the other night preaching. <laughs> And Mike goes out and he says, Preacher, I don't watch no news. He said, if I want to know the news, I come listen to you. That's what he said. <laughs> I'll listen to you. Generation Z. What's the last letter in the alphabet? Z. X. And what happened to Y? Z. 18. 29 years old. That's what they said would compromise that generation. And you know the sad thing about it? That is the generation that's having the most influence in this world, in this country especially. The Bible is so true. It is so true. It is true. The Lord standeth up to plead and standeth to judge the people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the ancients of his people, the princes thereof. For you have eaten up the vineyard and spoiled the poor is in, in your house. What mean ye that ye beat my people to pieces, grind the faces of the poor, saith the Lord God of hosts. Very quickly. I'll wrap this up. He says in that scripture that in the last days the old voices will not matter anymore. That's what he's saying. We don't want to hear them anymore. And yet I can't, I don't know exactly where it's at. It's either in a psalm or Proverbs. I preached on it before. I got a message on it at the house. It talks about the danger of getting off the old paths. It's in there. He calls it the old paths. Generation Z, they don't like the old paths. They don't like people like me. 
that believe in church and praying and, and you and stuff like that. The Bible says that this is, remember, the Bible says that there was a generation that they would live and they would do what was right in their own eyes. It's here. I believe it's here. What this book says, what I say don't count no more. About like preaching to the wind to those folks out there. But let's get to the bottom line here and I'll leave it with you. What he says is this. Let me tell you what your problem is. You got bad leadership. You have chosen the wrong leaders is what you have done. And because of that, he says in that scripture, the people are oppressed because the people that's leading them don't know what they're doing. That's what he says. They're responsible. They have no heart for the struggle. And he says what happens with this leadership like they had, and, and this ain't the first time he's called them out. We haven't been through this. He said they desire luxury, and they desire money and things more than they care about the people. That's what God said. That's what he said. The danger that we're in is this. We live in a world where the outside appearance is more important to them than the inside is. If I look good, I smell good. If I drive a new car, I got a big bank account, life's good. That's the world I live in today. I look back, and I guess I look back too much sometimes, probably all the time. But um, I can't help but look back at some of the things I did when I grew up that I couldn't tell y'all about. Or y'all would fire me. And then I look at what's going on in the world today, and, and this is what I think. I wasn't so bad after all. I would never do in my wildest dream. Satan ain't got enough lies in his book to make me do the things that I see done today in this world. He ain't got it. And I think, as John said, so quickly, come, Lord Jesus. All right, Mr. Bill, where you at? I'm going to turn it over to him to thank you for being with us tonight. We're fixing to have a, a church conference.